And as Steve was so kind to mention, I'm going to be talking about, as I call it, MIO, but most, I've been hearing a lot of people saying MIO and it rolls, it rolls off the tongue. Uh, originally, I think the uh, name was for mini IO, but Dave Herman coined metal IO and I ran with that. So MIO for short, metal IO or MIO, whatever. Uh, so I started working on it about a year ago. I had some free time on my hands and I thought, let me try a project, a Rust project to really you know, get more familiar with Rust. I had already been using it for a bit, but I still hadn't reached that comfort zone that I was uh, looking for. Uh, we, I work at Tilda and we have a product skylight that is using Rust in production. And I, it's been using Rust in production for over a year, almost a year and a half now. So we, I believe we were the first users, production users of Rust, which if you remember a year and a half ago and all the changes, that definitely came with some uh, dedication. Uh, in fact, we, we, at some point, I think end of October 2014, we we're like, we need to get things done. We're gonna freeze the version of Rust and just once 1.0 1, 1 hits, then we'll worry about updating. Anyway, uh, it took up until just about now to get on the, get on the nightlies again, because that upgrade from October, anyway, I'm getting on tangent. But, uh, so I was going to work on originally a web framework, because that was something that interested me. Unfortunately, there were no suitable HTTP libraries that I wanted to build on. So there, were, there was Hyper, which is, is a great library, but it's based on synchronous IO and the one thread per connection model. It's not what I was looking for. It's not really the best way to build a server that can scale out um, as well as possible to many connections. So, okay, I, maybe this is a good place to start instead, an HTTP server. I can do it the way I want. One thread, one dedicated thread to handle all the open sockets and maybe a thread pool to, like, to run the request handling on and of course the ability to asynchronously respond to requests. Okay, so I'm gonna work on HTTP server. Now, now what? Let's, work, let's figure out how to start writing this, the IO code, the underpinnings of the HTTP server. Well, uh, Rust had TCP support, it, but again, it was only synchronous sockets not what I was going for. So maybe I, I started looking at some C libraries and there was libuv and there were others. Uh, libuv is a great library, it's very portable. One problem is that it's not exactly idiomatic Rust. So I don't know if any of you really tried binding C libraries, simple libraries tend, tend to be okay, but as you get into more complex involved C libraries, the Rust, the fact that it's not written, I mean it's written in idiomatic C, Rust has its own idioms, and also Rust has a way of kind of shoving the ownership problems into your face. So, which is a good thing, don't get, that's why I use Rust. But it could be pain, I mean it ended up being a little painful to try to do. Uh, another thing I wasn't a huge fan of is that LibUV uh, uses as its primary abstraction model uh, something that's really optimized for Windows. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that later, it's kind of foreshadowing. But, um, okay, so I decided not to use LibUV. The last real option I had was writing directly on OS APIs. And for Linux, that means using ePoll. For OS X and FreeBSD and other BSDs, that's KQ. For Windows, that's using IOCP. And also, I'm discovering now there's something called Registered IO, which I just discovered this like two weeks ago. I'm not a Windows developer. Okay, also, something I'll talk on. Um, so, <laughs> Writing, like writing an IO system that's really portable is actually a huge amount of work. And at this point, libuv seemed like it probably would have just been the best option to use it, but I was not doing this to ship code. I was doing it for fun, so it was an opportunity to try to learn something new. Um, so, okay, I'm going to try to write an IO abstraction for Rust. Nothing had been done yet, kind of, at that level, how to write an asynchronous IO abstraction, so it seemed like a good opportunity to just, you know, try to do something. So I started. First decision was to figure out which IO model I was going to base MIO on. And there are two primary models. There's the readiness model and the, com the completion model. And they're, they're pretty vastly different. Readiness model is what ePoll and KQ, et cetera, use. And the completion model is what Windows and LibUV, and I think Solaris as well, but I have not looked at Solaris. Maybe I'll look at Solaris when Rust supports it. So, in the readiness model, the way it works is the kernel notifies you when a socket is ready to operate on. 
and the way this allows to, uh, multiplexing sockets, many sockets on, on a single thread is you say, hey kernel, I have all of these sockets that I care about, tell me when any of them are ready. And the kernel will watch them for you and when data is received or when the socket becomes writable, it then gives you back, you know, hey, these sockets are ready to be operated on. And at that point, you can call read or whatever operation you want on the socket and it's ready to complete immediately so it does not need to block the thread. So just to illustrate, take a TCP socket. If there's no pending data, the call to read is going to return with a wood block. And this is a socket set to non-blocking mode. And this tells you that it, if it was a blocking socket, it would, it would block. Um, so the next step is, once that happens, you then pull for readiness. And this is epoll, kq, et cetera. So you then block your thread, waiting for the kernel to tell you that the socket is ready. Socket becomes ready, and finally, we can call read again, and this time, the buffer that we supply will be filled with data. The completion model is almost the reversal. So, instead of waiting to be notified for a socket to be ready, and then operating on the socket, first you operate on the socket, say, I want to read, that read gets fired in the background, and you're then notified when the read completes. So, to illustrate again, a TCP socket, right, you issue the read, you supply a buffer. Um, first thing that happens is that buffer, the ownership of it, gets passed to the kernel. So you, in C land, you will still actually own a, you'll still have the pointer to that buffer, but you can't free the memory, you can't read from it, you can't write to it, obviously bad things will happen, this is what Rush protects you from. Uh, at that point, once you call the read, the, the call to read unblocks, and you're free to do other work, whether it's, you know, I don't know, operate on other sockets, or do something completely different, you know, run a busy loop, whatever. At some point, the socket is going to receive data, and once it does, the kernel will fill the buffer that it has ownership of with the data that it has received. On the user space, we're finally ready to check to see if the read completed, so we pull for completeness, uh, for completions, and this is a completion port on Windows, but it's basically a queue that you pop off completion notifications. And once the you pop off the completion for that read, you'll get back ownership from the buffer, and now you can read the data from straight out of it. Some things to note, you cannot use stack allocated buffers, because, or at least you cannot with great difficulty, because once you pass the buffer ownership to the kernel, you then, you have to make sure that the, the buffer stays alive for the entire, uh, entire lifetime of that operation. Also, because you're passing ownership of the buffer to the kernel, every single read operation that's currently in flight requires its own buffer. So, what that kind of means is that the completion model is going to force you to bring the value, in this case, the result of the read into existence, even if you aren't ready or don't want it. With, and con uh, contrast that with epoll and the readiness model, a really powerful trick is the kernel notifies you that a socket is ready, you get that notification, but you decide, I don't want to operate on the, on the socket quite yet, I'm going to track that it's ready and deal with it later. So here's a, some simple pseudocode so I could fit it on a slide, it's basically a proxy. You have a source socket and a destination socket and you want to copy data from one to the other. And the trick here is when the de each socket, the destination of the source is ready, all you do is track, oh, the, the socket is ready, and when, once both are ready, you can read in one go, read into the buffer, and write to the destination. So because the read and the write happens all at once, the, um, we can use a global buffer. So in this case, we only have one 4K buffer op like in use for the entire program. Shimming some other details I'm not gonna talk about here. But anyway, uh, so this, this technique can actually be used to implement proxies, for example, that have very low memory requirements and it's a really powerful feature. But now, the, I introduced the two models, and you may have tell, uh, be, be able to tell from the way I talked about it, I'm a little biased, I have my personal opinions, which one I like better, but at the end of the day, uh, it doesn't really matter which one is better, the operating system provides the model to you, and if you want to write code that runs on Linux or Windows or OS X, you have to write code that uses the model on that operating system. So, if a library that wants to be portable decides that it wants to provide the readiness model, on Windows, it has to implement the readiness on top of completion, and on, the reverse is true as well. If a library decides to pr uh, provide a completion model, 
it has to implement the completion model on Linux, which is readiness. Anyway, and when you bridge these two models, there's going to be a little bit of overhead. It's not a huge amount of overhead, but one goal with MIO was to be close to the metal, was really, I went at that level, those little things will matter. So no matter what, you gotta pick one. And I ended up going with the readiness model, and that's because I wanted to, <laughs> so yeah, I will get more into this, but I wanted to build something that was extremely cheap, essentially zero cost abstraction on platforms that I cared about and most people cared about. And Reality is twofold. One, Linux servers are the majority when it comes to production servers. And uh, in my, are there any Windows, like really Windows fans here? I'll be proxy for Windows. All right, sorry. We could, so I'm, I, I'm, I am kind of hating, I'm just, anyway. We'll talk about Windows later. So my humble opinion is that on Windows, people care about raw I.O. performance a bit less. So, if we can do something that's really close to metal Linux and then as close as possible on Windows, that's gonna be a huge win. Uh, and Rust as well, like I, when I came to Rust, I came from Java, Ruby, and one thing that really drew me was Rust itself was like really, when it's finding, its, like finding itself and really starting to focus on zero cost abstractions, that was something that really resonated with me and that's what I wanted to bring to an IO library. So, that's the intro. Now let's get into how does one use MIO. And it's going to be based on ePulse, so if you have any experience at all, some of this will seem very familiar. There are three basic steps. The first thing what you have to do is just you know, wait for sockets to be ready. Step two, do something with the sockets. And then step three, repeat. That is most of everything. So, the fact that this pattern of just this pattern, this loop, is, con is a pattern that keeps coming up, MIO starts by just giving you an event loop. So this could be in a main function. Maybe, like, you know, there'll probably be other, I'll fill in the example a bit later, but start by creating an event loop. Then you define a handler, and this handler's job is to be step number two, which was to do something with the sockets. You start the event loop with the handler, and the event loop now is going to do step one, wait for socks to be ready. Step two uh, is going to then call the handler's ready function with the socket that, like the information of, about the socket that is ready. And in the handler implementation, you do something, and then you return, and the event loop's gonna repeat. So just run, the, uh, run everything in a loop. And that is the most important bit. But there are some more details. I've not quite yet talked exactly what socket events mean. So I said already like when a socket becomes readable, and that means a socket received data, it becomes readable. When a socket becomes writable, aka like when you're establishing a TCP connection, once the, connect, the connection is established, then that socket becomes writable because you can write to the socket. Also, if you have a very heavy write load on a socket, you will eventually fill the, the buffer, and once the buffer, the socket buffer is full, you can't write to it anymore. So it's not writable at that point, and once the buffer's flushed, um, the socket becomes writable again. So those are the event, the socket events that I'm talking about, uh, that you'll get notified in the ready handler. And there are a couple different ways to, that those notifi notifications can get delivered. So the first is edge trigger, and this edge trigger um, notifications is what most people are gonna really expect with a library like MIO. So the events, once they happen, are fired only once, and they're, I mean, they're only delivered once to the handler. So what I mean is, if a socket receives data, it becomes readable, the handler then receives the uh, readable event. If the handler doesn't read from the socket, and the data stays on the socket, on the next event loop iteration, there will be no more notifications on that socket. There will not be any more readable notifications for that socket until new data is received. So when using edge triggered events, one thing, that is one thing to keep in mind. So either you're, you either have to read all available data on that socket or just track that socket still readable and read the rest later. Whereas level triggered is pretty different. Uh, with level triggered, it's, some say it's easier to use, but every single event loop iteration, every single socket that's readable and or writable or whatever interest that you read, ask for, if, 
it will notify the handler every single loop iteration that a socket is readable. So there are use cases for this, um, and I just want to put it out there, but unless you know that you want to use this, I would recommend to use edge trigger notifications. Just to kind of illustrate exactly the point, like at the st start, you register the sockets, um, you receive four kilobytes, you get the notification, read two kilobytes, and then loop everything up to there is the same, but once you loop, only level triggered will get the notification again, versus edge triggered, you will no longer get that notification. So, continuing on uh, with the previous example, let's just kind of set it up so that we can accept, like we're, this is gonna be a little mini server that's really not gonna do anything. We're gonna set it up to accept connections on ports 6567. First step is you just create a TCP listener uh, to note this is a MIO TCP listener. MIO implements all of its uh, socket types itself. They're very, very, very similar to the, uh, st the socket types in the Rust standard library. The main difference is that the MIO types are non-blocking, whereas the standard IO types are blocking. Um, so once you have the listener, you can register it with the event loop. And here we're going, since it's a server socket, we're gonna say we want readable notifications. Uh, with a TCP listener, when a connection is pending on it, it's, you are notified with a readable notification. And we say we want edge trigger notifications. And finally, we also pass in this magic token, which I'm going to talk about a bit later, but the token is how you identify in the handler which sockets uh, trigger the notification. Um, yeah. So now let's update the, uh, the handler. First we accept in a loop, we're gonna accept the uh, new sockets from our server socket, and it's the same function name as the TCP listener in uh, standard IO, however, the difference, and this is the main difference between MIO sockets and uh, standard, standard, uh, Rust standard library sockets, I must be a shorthand for that, uh, is that the return type is different. So in MIO, you get almost always a result of an option of T, so in this case, the new TCP stream. And that's because, you know, in, if there's ever an error, it's just gonna return with an error directly, but there's also the case that you're trying to perform the operation on the socket, and the socket is not ready yet. And because it's non-blocking, it's gonna return directly. And in that case, you will get the okay none. Um, not, the socket not being ready is not actually an error case. It's normal to happen during the like, runtime of a well-written app. Because MIO may sometimes fire off spurious notifications. So even if a socket is not ready, it's still permitted to send off a notification of readiness. And this is, due to the underlying system APIs, but so because of that, you always need to handle the okay none gracefully or your server will crash for no reason. Um, so tokens. So far, we, you know, we've associated the socket with the event loop and we were notified when it's ready. Only, but in our, in our handler, we're only dealing right now with one socket. So, it's really easy, we get a ready notification, we know it's for a server socket. But MIO is built for dealing with many, many sockets, hopefully thousands and thousands, so we need to be able to identify which socket triggered the notification. And that's what the tokens are for. Um, when you register the socket with the, uh, with the event loop, you will pass it a unique token, and that token will be returned in the handler. So the token is simply a struct tuple around u size. It's a very simple type, and the reason it's being used is because every uh, OS, like OS IO system, allows for at the very least a pointer size worth of data to be associated with uh, the socket. So MIO just does that. We're just gonna associate, like, drop in a token and return it when it's ready. So in the handler, the general pattern is to store, have, have some sort of map structure of uh, where token is the key and you map it to the socket in question and any associated socket states. Uh, one question I get a lot and why did I not just like, provide callbacks as the API because that seems to be, I mean that's pretty common. A lot of asynchronous I.O. libraries uh, just go with callbacks. So 
The short version is that my, my initial goal for MIO was to provide the zero cost abstraction and tokens was the only way of doing that. Uh, I didn't, I, my, my kind of guideline of how to design and my own what features to add and whatnot was basically how far can I push, push the envelope before, uh, without adding any overhead. Again, star Linux and we'll work on that later. But, uh, so hopefully, you know, if other people want to like callbacks or like a, like a future or stream based model, you can build that on top of MIO. But at the same time, if you're working on a TCP proxy where being as close to the metal as possible is really important, um, you don't have to throw away everything because that's something I found in the past. Like, oh, I'm, I'm going to play around like writing just really actually just a TCP router that has a little bit of business logic in it. I found either I had to use libraries and systems that had more overhead than I really wanted or I had to dive down to system APIs directly. So that was something I wanted to avoid with MIO. And especially with you know, Cargo and Crates.io and the ability to just build these small packages, I'm hoping that people will experiment. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe a callback style, that's not my, my favorite, but maybe that's what everybody, like, everybody wants. You can, and there'll be some other library that builds on top of MIO that builds callbacks. Because uh, by providing the token strategy, like which is zero cost, you can build callbacks on top of that just as efficiently as if you went directly to system APIs. The reverse would not be true. So, so far what we got is, recap, how MIO is used. Step one, well you create the sockets and then you register the sockets with the event loop, specify the token and then decide whether you want edge or trigger or level tr notifications. Then you wait for socket readiness, and that's just by running the event loop, and the event loop will call the handler. Once the notification is received, you, receive, you get the token, look up the states, operate on the socket, and repeat. And because the, this, this is like a little, gonna be a little tip, this, um, because the pattern of looking up socket states by token was so common, as well as having to generate unique tokens, uh, I just went ahead and in MIO uh, provided this little ut utility um, the slab utility is just a map from tokens to whatever. So you can use it to map tokens to whatever, sockets and socket states. Uh, you can use it for, like, and it will handle generating the tokens for you, so you don't have to worry about, like, keeping track of that. Uh, also, it's pre-allocated, so at runtime, there are no allocations, and insertion, access, and removal are all extremely, extremely cheap operations. So, um, and because it's pre-allocated, like, the one catch, I guess, is that you have to, you can't resize at runtime, you have to decide how you're going to, like, how many, what's your capacity of your system, which I kind of think is a feature, but anyway. So just how you might use this, like, really simple to use. Here we're just making a new slab. It has a capacity of 1024 elements. Right now we're putting in foo, we get back the token. That token we can then use when we're registering a socket access and removal is about the same. Uh, yeah, so initially, uh, initially I was gonna put more examples, but they couldn't fit on slides, so what I did do instead, and I'm gonna provide links at the end, uh, was write up a well-confident example of the full echo server, and so that you can just read it on your own time versus me trying to fit all the code in here, because it gets a little tedious. But I'm um, just gonna to wanna to try to wrap up with a few thoughts, like, a, things to keep in mind when working with MIO. First of all, just if one interesting thing is that while I spent the entire uh, talk so far focusing on non-blocking sockets, it, because I'm using a decoupled like event loop from sockets, it's fully decoupled, whereas I think yeah, libuv requires, um, it, it's actually combined. Um, the sockets are part of it, but uh, you can use, you can actually use Rust standard library sockets which are blocking with MIO. So for example, while you don't want to read on the event loop, what you could do is like have a bunch of blocking sockets, use an event loop to track when those sockets are ready, and then farm them out to a thread pool. So at that point, it's kind of a middle ground between um, using one thread per connection and using just full non-blocking IO. So the basic strategy, one, one event loop to just watch for sockets, and once the socket becomes ready, you farm it out to a thread pool, and that does the synchronous read. Um, another thought, like, okay, another kind of tip, uh, if you, you really, really do want to minimize the work that happens on the event loop, it's really important to do. 
because anything, any bit of code that takes time is going to prevent other sockets from, be, from being handled. So if, like, if, and if that backs up, you're gonna have like a backlog of sockets to process that will cause availability problems. So I would recommend to kind of try to keep the event loop exclusive to non-blocking IO kind of work. And anything that isn't IO based, just use a thread pool or just move, move it off of the event loop for work. Finally, uh, question I also get a bunch is how do you share an event loop with multiple libraries or components uh, because the, you might discover using it, oh, the to when, you, when you're working with the event loop and tokens, you have to ha kind of know, you have to be in control of all the tokens. So sharing the one event loop across multiple components doesn't quite work well. And in my opinion, so again, if, that, if this is something people want to do, you can easily build on top of the MIO, but I'm not really a fan of sharing components. So I think that every component, whether it's the HTTP server or an HTTP client or even DNS lookup, I mean, I think that can be its handled, encapsulated its own event loop where all the code for just that is like just in there and then communicates uh, with the others cross thread. So an event loop is just a bit of code that needs to run on one single thread. So it's not that heavy weight and Actually, the, yeah, the thread scheduler is really, really good. It's decades of work put into to really optimize isolating like bad behaviors of each thread. So you can have like you can have still like maybe one component is using event loop and something weird might happen and it doesn't do the right thing. It won't affect other components. All right, really quick, and I save this for last. So short version as of today. Windows support, like MIO doesn't work on Windows. However, it's been something I've been wanting to and short of trying to improve the getting started and the docs and that kind of experience, Windows is kind of my next priority. Um, the problem is I'm, I work on MIO kind of my nights and weekends and whatever spare time I have, which really isn't much anymore, so work is slow, but I think Alex Crichton, I, we only talk online, so I, like, I never pronounce your name, but is going to do some, going to get it done, right? You're gonna get it done. Okay, so I don't have to do it, <laughs> woohoo. But um, the, first, the first kind of target goal with Windows support is just get the current API working on Windows. So as I said, the, that takes, it's a very readiness model API and getting that working on, complete, on the completion based completion system is going to add a little overhead. However, I think it can be the actual, uh, I, I spent a bunch of time trying to figure this out, and I think the actual overhead, we won't know until it's done, but I think it's gonna be pretty minimal compared to even something like LibUV. But after that, step two is going to be, okay, how can we expose some um, Windows specific, like non-portable APIs, but Windows specific, that kind of, that lower the level of, like just make it closer to the Windows model, but while diverging as little as possible. So that even though you may have to, hand, if you really, really care about raw IO performance on Windows, but, uh, sorry. Uh, but then you can, uh, you can, the amount of non-portable code is like more minimized. So that's, that's that, this is the end. Um, so like I said, here's, I'm just gonna point to GitHub because I have the readme. I started working on the guide. If you've tried to use MI on the past, you probably noticed there's basically no documentation. There was no documentation. Uh, there's documentation story, still not great, but I'm shipping at it away like kind of little by little, so I link to the guide, uh, the work in progress guide, and in that is uh, example server. So uh, yeah, get started. Um, I'm around for a little bit more today, probably another 30 minutes or so, because I gotta get a flight home, but uh, if you wanna talk, talk to me before I leave. Thank you.